Hello everyone, this is David from Automotive Press. I have two really interesting SUVs for comparison today. The refreshed 2022 Subaru Forester being compared to the RAV4 Prime. This is a plug-in hybrid version and this is the one I own. So I do know this car very well and it's going to be really interesting to do the comparison in terms of manufacturing quality and the driving feel. So let me tell you which one I like better and what the differences are between these two SUVs. So I have the 2022 Subaru Forester right here, which has become one of the favorite and popular SUVs around. It's truly a proven model. But did you know that uh, Toyota actually owns 20% of Subaru as a company? So over the years, I've noticed more and more collaboration between Toyota and Subaru, although they do keep two distinct style and character. And also, it's very interesting to note about the Subaru logo, which has six star. Now, Subaru means seven clusters of stars from a Greek word. But there's only six stars in the logo because apparently the seventh star is an invisible one. Well, that's kind of interesting trivia. So let's go into the comparison of the quality of the exterior by doing my engineer's audit of the two cars. By the way, the Forester has a 2.5 liter flat four engine in naturally gas version. It doesn't come in hybrid, doesn't come in plug-in hybrid, but the engine is actually quite proven it is paired with a CVT engine. But let's get back into the quality audit I often do with my car reviews. This Forester is built in Japan at the Goomba factory, where I have been a number of times. And so it's gonna be interesting to compare with a RAV4 plug-in hybrid that I have, because that's also built in Japan at the Takaoka factory. Let's take a look at the gap and alignment of the panels. Now, I have to admit, this is uh, quite, uh, quite well done because the gap is about 3.5 millimeter to four millimeters between the hood and the front fender, which is top notch. Um, anything less than five millimeter is considered good. If you get to four or even less than four millimeter, it's best in class. And between the front fender and the front door, it's also about four millimeter, maybe a 3.9. And between the front door and the rear door, it's also about the same, 3.94 millimeters. So um, if you look at all the gaps and alignment of the panels, they've done a perfection job. The quality of the panels and alignment of the panels are so good that I think it's actually better than cars costing twice or three times the Forester. Now let's take a look at the paint job and compare this to the RAV4. I'm going to do the paint thickness gauge, but first I'm going to take a look at the actual paint quality in terms of the pigmentation, uh, orange peel, the gloss, the smoothness, and then consistency. And once again, I'm actually quite uh, taken back by high quality of the paint. This is uh, probably as good as you're going to ever find, not just in this price category, but even in the higher price category. No orange peel, very consistent gloss, uniform painting throughout. Uh, you know what, this is pretty amazing and uh, I can't wait to do a direct comparison with uh, the RAV4 in a second here. Uh, so is there a difference in quality of cars that are built in Japan versus the one built in the US or Canada? You know what, in terms of stuff like paint job and paint quality and panel gaps, I think there is because the ones that are built in Japan tend to be really, really close to perfection. Let me measure the paint thickness and see how that goes. So I have the paint thickness gauge here to measure the thickness of the paint and the clear coat. The thicker the better typically, but you want the paint thickness to be between 120 to 180 microns. If it's too thick, that can indicate a repair job at a factory. If it's too thin, then that's also a manufacturing defect. Let's take a look to see what the Forester has. 121 on the front hood. 108 on the front uh, fender, 112 on the front door. So pretty well consistent between 110 to 130, which is pretty normal for Japanese cars. Most of them are always between sort of 115 to 125. Let me just check one more point here in the back. It's 107. So this one's a little bit thinner than the rest of the paint job. I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, so it's a 92.5 micron. So this one is a bit thin. So this D-pillar has a bit of a paint issue. It looks totally fine to me in terms of the actual quality as I look at it, 
But for some reason, the thickness of the paint over here, it's a bit thinner than what I would have expected. Otherwise, the paint job is excellent. Let's take a look and see how the manufacturing quality compares to the RAV4 Prime. Okay, so let's take a look at the gap in the RAV4 Prime. This one, as I mentioned, is built in Takaoka factory in Japan. I've been to that factory many times. It's one of the best factories within the Toyota family. And the gap here between the front fender and the hood, it's about 3.6 millimeter. And between the front fender and the front door, about 3.8 millimeter. And between the front door and the rear door, 3.9 millimeters. So this is world class. It's very difficult to get the gap less than four millimeter, but in the case of RAV4 and even the Forester, they have achieved that with grace. Uh, the panel alignment is almost perfect, and uh, I can't see any kind of misalignment in any of the components, including the plastic components here. So um, yeah, the overall quality of this RAV4 is second to none, as good or sometimes even better than the Lexus models I've seen. And in this regard, I have to admit both the RAV4 Prime and the Forester that are built in Japan do have better alignment and I think better paint job than the equivalent models that are built in North America. So is there a difference in manufacturing quality between the Japanese factories and the North American factories? In the case of uh, alignment of panels and paint job, I have to say there is a difference. So let's do the paint thickness check on the RAV4 Prime. 128 on the hood. 126 on the front fender, very consistent. 112 uh, on the door, which is usually the case, a little bit thinner on the door. 118 on the rear door, and in the D pillar is 122. So very consistent between kind of 118 to 125-ish. And so paint thickness is very uh, standardized across the board. The actual paint job, as I mentioned, in terms of gloss, and the uh, orange peel is excellent. I did notice a difference in the quality of the paint also between this RAV4 Prime and another RAV4 that we own, which is a regular hybrid. That one's built in Ontario, and the paint job uh, is a little bit different. Now let's take a look at the inside of the two models and see what the difference might be. So now I am inside the Subaru Forester. Let me do my usual uh, audit of the manufacturing quality by doing my punch test. So I go around punching away to see if I can replicate squeaks or rattle. Everything looks super solid. I will admit that the A-pillar has a bit of a looseness to it, but it has never translated into actual squeaks or rattles on the road. Uh, so all the panels look, uh, look good in terms of the fit and the finish. I am particularly impressed with the stitching, even double stitching here on the dash and also along the door. I love the contrast between this kind of brown color and a darker gray. Very beautifully done, looks really upscale and very much in, uh, uh, in context with what Subaru stands for, which is ruggedness. And uh, I also love the fact that all the controls are still button-based or dial-based. So we can actually uh, adjust the temperature, the ventilation, fans, even the uh, heater for the seats are button-based. And that makes it so much easier. I just don't really like the current trend of moving everything into the infotainment system where everything has to be managed through the panel. This is actually much better from an engineering perspective. I'm not too crazy about the uh, kind of splitting of the panels here between the eight inch infotainment system and the small panel above that for visibility reasons. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a great idea, but it works for Subaru. And uh, also keep in mind that um, the digital cluster here is only partially digital. It's mostly uh, normal uh, instrument clusters in terms of the RPM and the speedometer. Uh, but the center portion of the um, instrumentation is digitized. Everything else looks good. Ergonomics are good. Lots of controls on the steering. Uh, seats are comfortable, supportive. You set up nice and high. And once again, I can't find any other fault with uh, manufacturing quality inside. So it looks solid. Now let's take a look at the RAV4 Prime. The one challenge I see in the RAV4 Prime is that the infotainment is still somewhat outdated, especially the actual software behind it. Uh, the Toyota Tundra and the Lexus NX now uses a new Toyota connected system, much faster, much more intuitive system. But on the RAV4, it's still using a kind of older software. Uh, but in terms of the ergonomics, I like the uh, RAV4's buttons and controls. Just like in the Forester, we get big buttons, even rubberized uh, feel. 
and then the uh, ventilation and the uh, HVAC controls are all physically there. And so for the most part, we're still using physical buttons and also physical shifting forward and backward. So I'm thankful for that because I really do like having real buttons as opposed to ones that's all embedded into the infotainment system. Much like the Forester, we have a combination of um, a digital cluster with uh, actual physical uh, meters as well. Uh, in terms of the instrumentation, so that works really well. And surprisingly, we even get a paddle shifter in this Prime because it kind of mimics shifting when you shift up and down with the uh, paddle. So that's kind of interesting. The seats are comfortable as well uh, because they were trying to make the RAV4 Prime feel like a, a performance SUV. Uh, you get red stitching, a little bit more side support on the seat than the Forester uh, because that one has a bit of an outdoor theme. This one has a bit of a performance theme. Uh, otherwise, the two are quite comparable. I do like the Forester's interior better. It looks more uh, bright and upbeat and it looks more luxurious. I think the RAV4 Prime or just RAV4 in general needs to be updated for uh, the interior packaging and the controls. Uh, but other than that, functioning wise, they work well and quality wise is excellent in both models. So now I am in the 2022 Forester, which has gone through some refreshment for this year. Uh, there's no mechanical changes, so the powertrain is identical. It still has a 2.5 liter flat four engine. Uh, it's a four cylinder engine, not turbocharged, and it doesn't have a hybrid or plug-in hybrid as options. So that's one thing that Subaru really needs to work on. And according to rumors, Subaru may introduce a hybrid or even plug-in hybrid down the road. So we look forward to that. In the meantime, this uh, Forester has a very reliable system in terms of the engine, the transmission, the suspension. The handling is actually quite good. Uh, you get lots of good feedback from the road. It's quite agile, very predictable, very balanced. And most of all, what I like about the um, Subaru Forester, along with many other Subaru models, is the good visibility. The windows are super big here, and the front windshield and the rear window is also big. So these, uh, this, what we call the cows, are lower than normal SUVs. So you set up nice and tall, and the visibility is absolutely fantastic. So it feels very airy, very comfortable inside, and this is a trademark of a Subaru design. So this is one thing that's different from RAV4, because in that uh, vehicle, you feel like a little bit more closed in and not as open as this Forester. Um, the ride is excellent, very smooth, uh, maybe a little bit more agile and a little bit more of a feedback from the road than the RAV4. That one feels a bit more numb. Uh, and also the, um, the acceleration is actually quite peppy, despite having um, you know a sort of average horsepower and torque rating. The CVT works well, it's well matched to the engine. Of course, I would prefer a non-CVT transmission, but you know what, it works well in this Forester. So overall, what I like about the Forester in terms of my concluding remarks is that it's very airy, it has a good agile feel, very balanced feel. Um, it has everything you expect from Subaru in terms of visibility, good set of features, even a gesture control for raising and lowering temperatures. I just got that to start. Um, and you know what? It's a very consumer friendly, very predictable model with a good price and good value. Maybe the resale value wouldn't be as good as a RAV4, once again, because it doesn't have a hybrid or plug-in hybrid. But otherwise, this is one of those cars you can buy and keep it for many years because it's going to remain a very reliable and it's, you know what, it's like having a good trusted friend. The Forester won't let you down. It's always there for you. It's very supportive and uh, it's going to give you a delightful uh, driving experience and a very uh, maintenance free driving experience for years to come. Now let's take a look at the RAV4 Prime and let's see what the differences are. And if I like that thing better than this Forester. So now we've left the Subaru Forester and I am inside the RAV4 Prime. Now we own this vehicle, so we use it all the time. And we also own a regular RAV4 hybrid, not the plug-in version. So we're very familiar with the entire RAV4 lineup and it's a very interesting comparison to the Forester. The Forester does feel sportier. It has more road feel. The steering is faster. Uh, it feels a little bit more agile compared to this RAV4 which feels more luxurious. It's quieter, it's silky smooth, and um, just in general, it's more isolated from the road. 
it's almost like Toyota wanted to move the RAV4 a bit more upscale toward the Highlander. And from a buyer's perspective, I suppose that's a good thing because you're getting a feel of a luxury SUV at a compact pricing. And that luxury feel is especially evident in the plug-in version here because it's super quiet on the road, uh, because the, there's no engine that's making a noise right now. And uh, it's absolutely uh, smooth and refined. So there's a lot to like about the RAV4 if you want more of a luxurious feel in terms of the SUV. But if you want something that handles better, something a little bit more fun to drive and give you a bit more feel into your hand from the steering, the Forester is definitely a more fun to drive vehicle. So in terms of concluding remarks, once again, we're comparing apples to oranges here. Uh, if you compare this particular version of RAV4 to the Forester I was just driving, uh, because we get all of the advantage of electric car in the plug-in format. But aside from that, uh, the RAV4 does feel more luxurious, but it's also a bit more outdated. The inside is kind of boring. Um, there's nothing fancy or interesting about the interior design. Uh, and I think in that regard, definitely the Forester is a more interesting vehicle to own uh, because the interior of that thing is quite gorgeous. And finally, I cannot praise the plug-in hybrid version enough. It's just a fantastic powertrain. It's phenomenal in terms of performance and acceleration. And it is so ultra smooth when you step on the accelerator that uh, the Forester simply can't match the uh, RAV4 Prime in terms of uh, overall execution uh, when you are using this as an everyday car because this thing takes off like a rocket and it's just super, super smooth. So if you want something that's sportier and a little bit more agile and he has a bit of a character, go for the Forester. But if you want the smoothest, most refined vehicle and you are able to get hold of a prime version of the RAV4, then go for this one because not only do you save gas, uh, but it's also just a smoother, more luxurious feel all around. So that's my concluding remarks for the Forester vs. RAV4. It's an interesting comparison. Uh, there's a lot to like for both vehicles and you can't really go wrong uh, other than the fact that the two have a very different powertrain options. So keep that in mind when you're shopping for a subcompact or compact SUV and I have a lot more to share with you down the road. I hope you enjoyed my video but for now I'm signing off. Thank you so much.